Jordan and Gretzky, Serena and Ruth. Remembering great ones is easy to do. What about the no names who spent their whole lives? Long stepping footballs and catching sack flies. They're guys. Remember that guy. 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 They're just going to remember some guys now. Two seconds to go. Lavender three-pointer, and we're going to overtime in Lexington. Ha-ha! College basketball, CBS Sports. This is Remember That Guy, the show where we mine our memories for nuggets of nostalgia about peripheral players, past and present. Hey there, folks. I am one of your hosts, James. In fact, I am your only host this week. But don't worry, don't turn that dial off yet. I promise you don't have to just listen to me because I do still have a very special guest. The voice of March Madness. Please introduce yourself. That's right, it's me, Vern Lundquist, reincarnated. I don't think he's dead yet, but he, he still has been reincarnated into me, the very special guest, Xavier. He's hanging out with the ghost of Scott Norwood that I invoked one time, even though Scott <laughs> Norwood is super alive. <laughs> Xavier, it is so lovely to have you here with me. Diaz cannot join us right now, though he will join us later on in the show. However, before we get to that, I need to get to what's making memories for you right now, X. So we're right into free agency for the NFL, and it's always so fun. You get to see headlines such as Jets' John Simpson edition helps shape offensive line, but work still remains. Or mm. scouting new Jets QB, Tyrod Taylor. Or if you're a Jets Tyron? fan, you oh, get... Oh, shit! Tyrod's coming over to the Jets? That's great. We should leave it at that, Jets quarterback news. You guys got Tyrod Taylor. Awesome. Let's not talk about it. Unfortunately... Unfortunately, the rest of that headline is and how he fits as Aaron Rodgers' backup because then we get into the other Jets headlines that have been dominating the news. How an Aaron Rodgers VP run could factor into the all-important Bears QB race. Aaron Rodgers (laughs) denies allegations he shared Sandy Hook conspiracy theories. Can Aaron Rodgers run for US VP and play for Jets? Key questions for QB and team. And I can guarantee you No other team in NFL history has ever had their quarterback elicit headlines on the same day about sharing conspiracy theories about Sandy Hook being a false flag and running for vice president of the United States of America. Was it genuine genuine question? I remember it being the same 24 hours. Was it the same calendar day? So the the first... Aaron Rodgers VP stuff was like two days ago, but all of these headlines are okay. Okay, so I'll give it toxically in the political morass to have heard immediately that RFK Jr. wants. Hey, real quick, Aaron Rodgers, if you're listening to this, you're an idiot. I know that, but like, even you have to be smart enough to realize Robert R. Kennedy Jr. is not going to fucking do shit. Like, come on, man. Sorry, please continue. I mean, maybe that's why he's fine. Being the VP candidate, he could say that he was a VP candidate for for, uh, yeah, for president, and he wanted to do anything. But I will confirm that these athletic headlines, the two VP ones, were March thirteenth, twenty twenty four. The Sandy Hook one was March fourteenth, twenty twenty four. So they were within twenty four hours of each yeah. other, but not one calendar day. But also, why do I have to say this about my fucking team? What the hell? Diaz gave me the same option he gave me back in college of you have a one-time switch that you can make and no one will blame you if you do not want to support the jets yeah and just like i told him with the knicks i cannot make that choice no matter how painful it sets me up for the future i can't do that it is not a choice it is ingrained into my being i will be a jets fan no matter what conspiracy theorist is at quarterback for us I have to deal with that. Everyone else gets to deal with, oh, how is the cap going to work for this? Do we have to restructure Joey Bosa's contract uh, or Nick Bosa's contract? Do we have to cut Mike Williams? What do we have to do? No, I have to deal with this. But that's what happens when you're a Jets fan. Hey, you guys re-signed CJ Mosley. We restructured his contract by, <laughs> by, 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 by tearing up his old one and signing him to a new one. But it's essentially a restructuring because he would have been under contract for this year anyway just at a bigger cap hit that they didn't want to do. But I do like that move. I like everything the Jets have done 
in free agency. The Morgan Moses trade was great. They shouldn't have let him go in the first place. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's not what anyone in Jetland talks about about right now. (laughs) Well, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Is there anything else going on in your mind outside of it? Yeah, and good news, Arsenal did make the quarterfinals of the Champions League. For the first time since the 2009-2010 season when I was in high school. And that makes me very, very happy. Because since that time, 2010-2011, round of 16 and out. 2011-12, round of 16 and out. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, round of 16 and out. And then no Champions League for... 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 22, 23. So th- this has been a very long time for a team that before then, during the 2000s, quarterfinals, quarterfinals, final, quarterfinals, semifinals in the space of 10 years. This was a very long time without that. And I'm very happy that even though it took a penalty shootout against Porto, that was very stressful. And I was really hoping it wouldn't be that stressful. They got the job done. Big hump to get over for this young team. I'm very intrigued to see who we'll get because the options are Bayern Munich, Manchester City, Real Madrid, Barcelona, PSG, Borussia Dortmund, Atletico Madrid. You know, no one that's a pushover. As long as it's not like City, Bayern, or Madrid, Arsenal will probably be favored. But honestly, at this point, I, I'm happy they got that first knockout stage win under their belts. If they do play Bayern and they lose by like a goal uh, over two legs, it's not that big of a deal. I think it still sets them up for more in the future, but I'm just happy they got that one because if this team with this draw did not at least get to the quarterfinals, it would have been very disappointing. David, just asking, is this the year? Is this year? Hey, I don't think you have to say anything. I'm just, I'm just curious. Is this the year? Keeping our streak. That's the thing. I don't know what I would prefer to have because Arsenal haven't won the Premier League title in 20 years. This is the Mm -hmm. 20th anniversary of the Invincible season. And if they won the Premier League over this Manchester City and this Liverpool team in the emotion of Jurgen Klopp's last season, I think that would be a bigger achievement than winning the Champions League. But Arsenal have also never won the Champions League. So doing that would be historic. I don't know which would be a better indicator of a great team, but I would be happy. If you, if you gave me either, if you gave me either, I would sacrifice the other for it. Por que no los dos? Por que no los dos? Live deliciously. No, I, I was also watching the game very intently because, uh, not for your sake, though I'm very, very glad that they won for your sake, but uh, for the sake of our old friend of the show, Mr. Medicinal is why I was watching because I was waiting to start a book club with him. Uh, and I had to wait for that game to finish for us to start talking about our book. But, Let's stop talking about the footballs for a moment. If I may, I'd like to tell you about what's making memories for me with the hockeys. And that is the hockeys, plural. Because in the NHL, someone stole 18,000 Yaramir Yager bobbleheads. <laughs> someone did that today. The Penguins are going to have a Yaramir Yager head night. But someone stole 18,000 Yaramir Yager bobbleheads. At least 18,000. Any of those giveaways, they have so many more of those for like their you know fundraisers later on as their silent auctions like they've always got more of the fucking stranger things orioles bobblehead with a walkie talkie there's dozens of those hidden away so they probably stole like twenty thousand yaramir yager bobbleheads and i'm just i wonder whether or not the stealing of the bobbleheads was intentional or if it was just a like shipping container we're just taking whatever the fuck is in here and i don't know which one's funnier for someone to intentionally steal twenty thousand yarmir yager bobbleheads or for someone to steal something they don't know what some mystery box or maybe something they think is something else and to open it and find twenty thousand yarmir yager bobbleheads it is really fun saying that for us my, my favorite thing i've seen on twitter so far today was uh Someone posting Dominic Toretto from Fast and Furious saying we're going to do one last job. I'm just as a, as a Fast quote and tweet Furious to that. Five, <laughs> instead of the safe dragging behind the car, it's just an entire pallet of, once again, 20,000 Yarmir Yonker bobblehead. It's phenomenal. But I said the hockeys. That's NHL. Let's take a second to check in on the PWHL, which, Xavier, other than our beloved New York PWHLers, 
who are pretty bad. Uh, other than that, everything is going incredibly well for the league in its inaugural season. In particular, I mean, they're just putting butts in seats. They're drawing eyeballs. It's, it's starting to reach a crescendo moment because they've been doing phenomenally with attendance since the beginning. The home opener that Ottawa had when they hosted Montreal at TD Place on January 2nd, with just like months worth of planning. This was not a long thought out thing. This was put together quickly. And on that first home opener for Ottawa, 8,318 people set the record in attendance for any professional women's hockey game. Uh, here in North America, at least. I'm not sure if that's the case in Europe, but that did not remain the case here in North America for very long because then Montreal was once again on hand in Minnesota when they started playing at the Wilds XL Energy Center, which has a capacity of up to at least 13,316 because that's how many people were in attendance January 24th to see Montreal take on Minnesota. Once again, the PWHL Montreal team was in Toronto this time at the Leafs Scotiabank Arena. Big moment for like the PWHL Toronto team to get to suit up in the same dressing rooms as the Maple Leafs. And that game hosting the two top teams, Toronto and Montreal, have been the two top teams pretty much all season. Uh, they're both, as we speak right now, tied with 30 points in the standings. 19,285 people took it in that day on February 16th at Scotiabank Arena. So this has all been great. Well, in case you didn't catch that, Montreal, all three times, the guests for these record-setting games. And they said, we're tired of this shit. Bring it to home court. Something that had been kind of discussed and, and dreamed of, really, since the beginning of this season was, if we can get this to catch on, man, getting to host this in Montreal's Bell Center, the home of the Habs, the Montreal Canadiens, that would be huge. Like, that would be such a big moment. And wouldn't you know it, the PWHL Montreal and Toronto teams will indeed play in Bell Center, which has a maximum capacity of 21,105. Montreal has said, like, we want to set this attendance record. And like, how fucking great is it that they can very realistically have that as a goal that they're striving for this year? This is a game between Toronto and Montreal that was originally scheduled to take place on April 21st. The very best part of all of this is due to scheduling concerns with the Bell Center. It will have to be switched slightly. And so this record attempt is going to take place on the very nice April 20th. I hope you tune in if you are not able to make it to Montreal. Hopefully at least 21,105 people can make it. I don't know if they're allowing standing room, but yeah, dude, fucking rad for the PWHL attendance. I'm just we very love, excited about it. We all. love attendance records for women's sports. And that did remind me that Arsenal women currently are averaging a higher home attendance than 10 of the Premier League teams. Fuck yeah, dude. They are right now in between Everton and Brighton in terms of average in attendance. Terms of, and Jesus. they have played some of their games at, you know, a stadium that seats less than 10,000 because not all of their games are at the Emirates. A lot of them are because of the massive increased demand set in all those attendance records that they've set. But with some of that numbers being dragged down by a less than 10,000 seat stadium, mm -hmm. they still are outdrawing more than half of the Premier League, which is wild. So here, here's a question for you. This has nothing to do with anything except that you just mentioned Everton, which I know to be, and hey, here's some info for you, listener, if you don't know. It's the other team in Liverpool, my understanding. It's just those two, right? Those are the two yes. Liverpool teams, Liverpool and Everton. Mm -hmm. Is Everton more like, the? because they sound pathetic, with all due respect to any Everton fans out there, are they more like the Mets? the White Sox, or the Angels? What, like, sad sack second team are Everton most like? That's so tough, because I think they're technically better than any of those. They are, like, historically better than any of those, in that when the Premier League was founded, Everton were one of the big four or the big six, whatever it, like it was that started the Premier League. Like it was, as far as I'm aware, Arsenal, Manchester United, Liverpool, and Everton at that point. I'm I'm gonna take that then as White Sox. I'm gonna say it's an endorsement of White Sox because I mean they're huge to like the historical foundations of baseball. It's just that that league was formed a hundred years before the Premier League. Unless you're yeah. referring to, like, earlier stuff. I assume you mean, like, the roughly, what, 30-year-old Premier League now? Or yeah, so so in, in the 80s, Everton were really, really good. And they had they had been 
solid before then. You know, they had multiple championships in the 20s, 30s, 60s, etc. But in the eight, the mid 80s, they were the best team in England in the first division at that time. Won FA Cups, uh, League Cups, things like that. But they also were victims of the fact that England and English teams were banned from European competition due to stadium incidents, specifically... Uh, no. No, 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 no. Oh, is it when the, like, uh, shit was breaking and, and all the people died? Yes. Okay. So, uh... Sorry, I don't mean to sound that so <laughs> flippantly, but... No, no, it, it's fine. Uh, so, the Hillsborough... Yes. ...was, uh... It was a match between, I believe it was Liverpool and Juve. Uh, let me double. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. This, that, I'm, I'm conflating two different things. This one was Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. I think Heisel is the other. I, okay. Got it. Uh, the Heisel disaster was Liverpool and Juve, and that was 85. And this was a bunch of Juve fans were killed because Liverpool Jesus. fans uh, essentially formed a crush while trying to break through one area separating the fans. Yeah. And it killed 39 people and 600 were injured. And because of that... God damn, dude! Yeah, and, be- and this was in 1985. So this is ex- right when Everton were at their best. You know, they, they win the 84-85 title and the 86-87 title. This stadium, the Heisel disaster, causes English clubs to be banned for five years, Liverpool for six years. So essentially, Everton's best ever period since you know the 60s got overshadowed by the fact that their main city rival kept them from being able to compete in europe so it's essentially like imagine if the yankees were really good but the mets killed a bunch of people and so they banned the yankees from playing too and so is this or the like opposite, like opposite. question am i am or i like, supposed to, uh, to say like what the number of people i'd be okay with mets fans probably the opposite the probably, probably the yankees fans killing a bunch of people keeping the mets from being able to win stuff during that time to keep the mets now from ever being like as popular so everton they suck now but it also does suck that their best ever period they kind of didn't have a chance to really go for it and get some you know european civil war because of liverpool well, thankfully, PWHL not being overshadowed by anything in the way that Everton's <laughs> has it. No, I'm the one that brought that on. I'm the one that asked that question initially. And I stand by my shy socks appraisal. But anyway, folks, you don't need to worry about having to listen to Xavier and me jabber back and forth here today without any help. Because we were not alone when we recorded a previous segment with a new friend of the show and, of course, our other host, Diaz. And hey, just going to say real quick before we pop this on, because we're going to hopefully be having a couple more guests in coming weeks as we have some travel going on the next couple months. If you've ever listened to this and you're not one of the people that like we personally know and talk to, you've ever wanted to be on the show, hit us up. Let us know, man. We'd love to have you on. So you all know the regular links, bit.ly slash remember that guy, all one word, all lowercase. Anyway, as I was saying, we are going to meet with a guest. Often we are very honored to have our guests on this is maybe the most honored a guest has ever been to be on and i think ladies and gentlemen and everyone else we are pleased to bring to the show new friend of the show and graphics extraordinaire mike Cantor. how you doing tonight bud i am doing great i am tremendously excited to be here i cannot tell you how much i love this show uh let me put it this way here's every sports podcast that i listen to remember that guy that's the end of the list so this is you know this is my super bowl right here is being on rtg i thought you were gonna hit us with uh rtg 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 like the dylon dylon i thought thought we were going that way for a second yeah, there's uh there's Mr. Guy, there's Remember T Guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh so yeah, I have been a friend and coworker of Diaz's for a number of years. I do graphics, I also do stats, I write, I'm a researcher, I've covered the Olympics five times. I am just a lifelong sports fan who has become obsessed with listening to you fine folks 
talk about random guys from history. Well, we appreciate your legitimizing of this silly little enterprise. Mike, I guess, so we, as you've said, we've come to know you through your work with Diaz there on the back end of sports. I'm curious, like, you know, just what has initially made you into the kind of person that would be doing the insane graphics work that often keeps Diaz on the road for very insane hours frequently. So just so we can get a little background on where you're coming from vis-a-vis guy experience. So what's funny is when I was eight or nine years old, I wanted to be a pitcher for the Atlanta baseball team. Uh, I soon found out that I was a very terrible pitcher uh, and a very terrible athlete in general. So when I was about 10, I collected baseball cards. I was always good at math. I said, I want to be a sports statistician when I grow up. And by the time I was 22 years old, I was getting paid to do sports statistics. So it has been just a lifelong dream. All credit to my mom. Best mom in the world. Huge sports fan. She is the reason I do anything that I do today. No disrespect to my dad, who is great, does not care about sports. My favorite sport in the world, curling. It's the best sport. I will not hear any arguments to the contrary. I'm into it because when I was a little kid, my mom liked curling. So that's what I liked. Same with baseball. Same with tennis. Same with hoops. I mean, I think curling becomes everybody's favorite sport once every four years. But for you to hold it down and be dedicated in the other three years and 11 months, you know, I think that's that's a that's a a sign of dedication. I mean, it it has to be the the single most approachable Olympic sport. I'm not saying that, like, anyone can get great at it, but show me an Olympic sport that anyone can learn as easily as curling. I mean, aside from running. There's a there's a uh, couple, but curling curling's up there. But I just think about how America is ridiculous at rifle and just all those shooting. And it's normally just like a twenty year old from West Virginia who's the greatest in the world. And I'm like, yeah, I think that we all have the ability to do that if we felt like it. If you practice long enough and hard enough, yes, theoretically you could be a great shooter, you could be a great runner, you could probably be a great curler. But you could say anybody can get to the 90th percentile. It's getting to the top 10% that's tough. So I have tremendous respect for all curlers, amateur or pro. I sincerely hope that no disrespect was taken by anyone. It is a sport that we deeply respect. Uh, Speaking of things that, that you deeply respect, I can tell that you have an eye for numbers, and that does interest me a little bit, given that you often, I imagine, banter with Diaz while on the job about sports, because Diaz famously the most number averse of the three of us. I mean, here's what I'll say. Let me hedge that statement. The numbers that are on the stat sheets that Mike and I get handed at these games, I love those stats. Points. That's a thing. (laughs) <laughs> Rebound. That's a thing. Assists, I very clearly, that's a thing. Maybe somebody else had to do something, but it's a thing that you did. Okay. I, okay. I, where I hate numbers is I hate VORP and WAR and BPM and all these things. Like, if you can't tell me in 10 seconds what the stat means and how it's calculated, I don't care about it. You have 10 seconds to explain that to me. That's how I feel about numbers. We've, but, we've talked about this. Diaz is the embodiment of that meme, the chart that goes up, and on one side it's like he's got that dog in him. In the middle, it's you know middle, all these all, all of these numbers, and then at the end, it's he got that dog in him. That that's Diaz. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm on the lower the high end of the IQ with it, but I do know that I agree with the sentiment <laughs> very strongly. I think we're all willing to give you credit for being on the high end. Amongst this company, I'll take that. But I don't mean to interrupt. James, you had an actual question before I started ranting. Please, please. Finish <laughs> no, your just the, it, it was largely like, uh, Mike, what your general feeling about the importance of numbers is like how much that plays into you. Because I know that it is a that is a different approach that all three of us take at times regarding numbers. And I'm curious, like what we're going to hear from you, how kind of number centric your sports fandom still is. Well, tremendously. I I mean, part of it is because for work, that's what I have to, you know, I need to be ready to say that uh, this team has hit 
eight of their last nine field goal attempts. Or this person scored three points in the first 17 minutes of the game and 12 in the last four. It's the easy stuff like that, like Diaz was talking about. That stuff, I'm always happy to throw on a graphic. It's easy for people at home to wrap their head around. The thing that I have to think about is I can't use crazy technical stuff, even if I know what the stats are, because I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for everybody who's watching, and everybody who's watching is not going to understand. There's no reason to talk about war in the middle of a college baseball game. Just say that pitch was 92 miles an hour and it was fouled off. That's all you need to know. But for me personally, I am a big fan of analytics. I got Moneyball on the shelf. I'm all about him. I am not from the DS school, but I respect where he's coming from. Well, so, speaking... Sorry, yes. Well, I was, I was going to say, this actually leads quite well, if you don't mind me making my own transition, into my guy. I, I would love to do less work, yes. I think that's a first. <laughs> this is impressive. Well, I told Diaz that I had a surprise. As soon as he said, come on the show... I knew exactly who I was going to propose for induction, didn't have a second thought. But I had so much fun running that presentation, I just couldn't stop. So I have two complete presentations prepared. They are both way too long to fit into the same episode. So I'm going to give you a very brief synopsis of both. And I will let the three of you decide who you want to hear about today. Wait, wait, no, I, I have a be- I have a better idea. I have a better idea. Oh, please. Rather than give us any sort of inkling about what it could be, we flip a coin. Diaz calls it in the air for what, what it's going to be. And then this just means the other one, you have to come back on a second time and tell us about that guy. I would be thrilled. I am I all for arbitrary, silly events, determining things of great importance. I'm all for it. Says the man who uses chat GPT to break ties whenever he is the tie-breaking vote. I mean, I can ask chat GPT to flip the coin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got standard quarter here. Eagle is the tails. G-dubs is the heads. I, Diaz, I have a guy A and a guy B in mind. Diaz, I have flipped it. It is covered. Oof. I mean, am I, am I predicting it? Yeah, you're predicting it. You're it, predicting it. It's A if you get it right, it's B if you get it wrong. Okay, I like that. I mean, look, you said Tails is an eagle, bro. Like, t- go birds. Come on. Give me that Tails. It is heads. No. Give us Guy B. I love that. The birds have let uh, us down again, Diaz. What a year. Fucking birds, man. Ugh. Uh, this is actually the guy who I assumed you were going to pick anyway. So it worked out. So, I have a treat for you, my friends on the illustrious Guy Bunal. I am presenting somebody in a sport that has never been discussed on RTG before. And trust me, I've listened to every episode (laughs) I would know. Without the slightest bit of exaggeration, this guy directly and dramatically impacted pop culture in a number of ways, including how you watch his chosen sport. I promise you, you don't know his name yet, but you do know his work, and you will be in all of his accomplishments. I am here to talk about Charles Bark. No, I'm here to talk about <laughs> Henry Orenstein. My guy is named Henry Orenstein. I'm assuming nobody has heard of him here before. I feel like I know who he is because you have vaguely discussed around him at like pre shows. Yeah. So. Henry was born into a Jewish family as Henrik Ornstein, October 23rd, 1923 in Poland. You can tell this story starting out dark. I promise we will get through it very quickly. One of five children, four boys and a girl. His parents were named Leb and Golda. The Nazis invade Poland in 39, just before Henry turned 16. The male Ornsteins flee to the Soviet-occupied part of Poland, They don't think that the Nazis are going to take the women, but they're concerned for themselves. A couple years later, they come back, they've kind of run out of money, they miss their family. Tragically, 1942, Henry's parents are executed. The next year, 
all of the kids are sent to concentration camps. Henry is in five different camps. At the Bujin labor camp, 1944, uh, this was actually the last one he would go to, the Nazis ordered all scientists and mathematicians to register with camp administration. The Ornsteins do not have a background in science or math, and they don't know if the Nazis are trying to, you know, get them to help or kill them because they want to get rid of the smart Jews. Fortunately, I mean, the brothers registered, of course, and the answer was use them. So, thank God, this kept most of the Orensteins alive. One brother, unfortunately, died two days before liberation. Their sister died on a death march. But three of the Orensteins survived. A little bit of foreshadowing here. Henry said registering as a scientist was, quote, gambling for time. It turned out to be a good gamble. He also noted that the math problems he was given were very easy. Well, no, with the uh, the math problems being very easy, it takes me back to the only math class that I took in college was like a very basic probability. And it was literally like if event A has one in five chance and event B has one in two chance, what's the chance that both events happen? And like that was my final times 50. You know, you say that. And from what I've read, I don't think the problems they were given was much harder than that. Prevailing wisdom is that the people who ran this camp just wanted to make everyone look busy. So they just gave them, you know, Henry said eight year olds could have done the problems I was given. It was quite I, I was a bit of luck. this was going to be when we found out that Nazis were bad at math. Then I remembered that America did employ a bunch of Nazis to do math for NASA. So, <laughs> so Henry gets out of this camp. He has a brief marriage. They split up 1947. Henry and his two brothers emigrate to the U S they settle in Manhattan with their uncle. The first thing that becomes really apparent is Henry's business acumen. Uh, he worked for a clothing company, a canned food company. His first business of his own was a grocery store that he sold. In the 1950s, he and his uncle started the Topper Corporation, which made toys. Created a whole bunch of popular toys, including the Susie Homemaker line of mini appliances and the Susie Cute Doll in 1964, for which Henry commissioned a commercial that he directed starring Louis Armstrong. He's so cute. He's so sweet. The prettiest doll you ever meet. And her name is Susie Q. Uh, Henry said that Louis Armstrong was very drunk the entire time. It's very funny. Topper clearly a big enough company that they can get, you know, a mega star like Louis Armstrong in a commercial. They were an early producer of Sesame Street toys. He created a really popular gun called the Johnny Seven One Man Army. He created all sorts of toys. He never stopped inventing. He had a hundred patents. Among them, the first doll whose eyes blinked. Or blunk. Blanked? Who knows? A doll whose hair grew when you raised her arm. Patents with titles like Hoppity Toy System, Toy Sink, and this is a real title for a patent that he was granted, Ornamental Design for a Duck. <laughs> it's just a duck. Here's the link. There is nothing special about it. It's just a duck with lips and eyebrows. I have no idea why you need a patent on that. Man, we he should try married. and get a patent. Uh, my dad is actually an inventor, and he, the last patent he got, he said, you want me to put your name on this? You want to be a co-inventor? And I was like, that sounds cool, but also illegal, because I haven't done anything. I don't <laughs> want to be involved. So we're in the mid-60s. Henry Ornstein meets the woman who, with whom he's going to spend the rest of his life. They meet in 1967, when she was hired to demonstrate Susie Homemaker at his toy fair. You want to guess her name? Was Susie. her name Susie? <laughs> her name is Susie. Hell Spelled yeah. differently, but still awesome. Uh, they have a son named Mark, a daughter named Annette, but not before Henry's first interaction with sports. This is not the sport we're going to talk about, but it is a fun little sport aside. Topper Corporation creates a line of miniature cars to rival Hot Wheels. They're called Johnny Lightning because that's the most American name in the history of toys. 
This line comes out in 1969. Nice. Very nice. In true Henry Orenstein style, he patents a mold that allows the cars to be propelled by a lever-powered catapult. The next year, he realizes, I have the perfect licensing opportunity for Johnny Lightning. Al Unser Sr.'s race car. Driving the Johnny Lightning Special, Unser wins the 1970 Indianapolis 500, along with nine other races that year. And he goes back-to-back -back at Indy in 1971. This car looks awesome. You wish they still made race cars that looked like this. For everybody listening, the, the it very is essentially... On it. Yes, Ooh. it is basically a Hot Wheels come to life. Imagine if Lightning McQueen was real and also cool. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's an open it's an open wheel. It's more like Formula One or you know IRL. Also, I'm surprised they never got sued over that name because the Fantastic Four existed at that point. So there already was Johnny Storm, and they just went with Johnny Lightning. I don't know if I was Stan Lee, I might be like <laughs> that's awful close. Yeah, because Stan Lee had a is, foot to stand on on taking people's ideas. <laughs> All I'm going to say is, lightning is way faster than a storm. It makes sense for a car. I'm okay with it. The funny thing about this race car, which I tried to find, I do not know why. The first year it had the number two on it, and the second year it had the number one on it. Super cool. Henry Ornstein actually gives Al Unser a $30,000 bonus the first year, which is, you know, for that time, insane money. You'd think this would be a huge boon for business. Very briefly, it is. But, very unfortunately, Henry's burdened by debt at this point. He resigns as topper CEO and president less than a year after the second Indy 500 win. The company files for bankruptcy in 1973. Henry claimed that he lost everything. And Susie said about Mattel, the company that made Hot Wheels, former employees would tell us how they'd have days of meetings on how to destroy Henry Ornstein. But, come on, if the Nazis can't kill this guy, Mattel is not going to. He keeps yeah, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's ridiculous. He's still creating, just for other companies. He gets the joy of designing, inventing, Maybe he gets some profits, but he doesn't have any of the risk. The rest of the 70s, no smash hits for Henry. I read a ton about him. I legitimately couldn't find much about what he was working on during the mid to late 70s. But Drugs? He had... It's, I mean, a lot of people were, were kind of like getting lost in some stuff in the mid to late 70s. He still had patents, but not at the same clip as he did before. Oh, look, I'm not Don't speculating. Checks out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is, like, I feel like people got into that to unleash their creative side, and Henry's already cranking out patents left and right. So, plenty creative as is. That's it or maybe he's a in a dry bit. spell. Who knows? But he soon has an idea that all three of you have heard of. I would posit that almost every human being on Earth has heard of what comes next for Henry. Sometime around 1982, again, weirdly, no source could give me a specific date. He's at a toy fair. He sees a product created by a Japanese con company called Takara. They would, many years later, become known for creating Beyblade. The toy Henry saw was a car that could change into an airplane. A related Takara line was called Car Robots. I think you see where I'm going with this. He saw Transformers in their protozoic state. He knew the president of Takara. Henry pitched him on bringing the toys to America. Henry said, quote, I think this could be a great thing, building a bridge between Japanese ingenuity and American marketing. He took to the idea to, who else? Hasbro. Fuck Mattel. Henry comes up with more ideas. He brokers the deal. This man single-handedly convinced Hasbro to start manufacturing Transformers in 1983. They ship in 1984. The rest is very lucrative history. I just love the pitch, because the pitch is basically, hey, 
you guys are really good at building cool things. And we're really we're, good at telling people that things are cool. The American totally. secret of marketing. I mean, what's more American than stealing somebody else's idea and using it for your own? That's not that's not what actually happened. He worked with Takara. It was a very amicable relationship. But it's funny to think about. This is a man who's been known for his inventions over the years. His biggest success isn't actually something that he invented. But he is the reason that Transformers came to the U.S. He's the reason every little boy loves robots. He's the reason for a $5 billion series of films that keep getting cranked out, even though they're never very good. To quote former Hasbro chairman Alan Hassenfeld, Ornstein was absolutely the catalyst that made this happen, and that to be able to take a car and with a little bit of dexterity change it into another toy, that was something magical. Finally, we get to the real meat and potatoes of the sports part of the story. And I promised you that this was a sport that you've never heard about in RTJ. Henry, sitting on a pile of cash, he loves backgammon. Susie, however... Fuck yes! Su uh, you're, you're not going to be a fan of this next and part just... where Susie calls it too boring. No! Discourages him from playing backgammon. Devastating. It's... Susie's broken my heart. Sorry, James. But she does encourage him to take up poker in the mid-80s. Keep in mind, he's in his mid-60s at this point. Also, interestingly, Susie does not stick around to watch him play poker. He finds this boring, but less boring than backgammon. So, he has all this money, he uses it to get very high-level lessons, he plays in cash games, he plays in tournaments, he starts going to the World Series of Poker, because why wouldn't you? In 1993, he finishes in 12th place in the main event. In 1995, he finishes in 8th out of, like, 400. Brief aside for a few of the luminaries who managed to be in the top 7, the winner, Dan Harrington, future Poker Hall of Famer, Hamid Dasmalchi, Won the event three years ago. He's back at the final table. Another Hall of Famer, Barbara Enright, this year becomes to date the only woman to make the final table of the main event at the American World Series of Poker. So a lot of Wait, history that there. Still hasn't yeah. happened since then. Yeah, crazy. Now, I will get to in a little bit. We're only talking about the American World Series of Poker here. Okay. Okay. There's a little more foreshadowing. So, that was 95. The next year, 96, Henry comes back. He wins a World Series of Poker bracelet in seven-card stud. It becomes his only bracelet, but still, not many people win a World Series of Poker event. Not many people get to take home $130,000 for a couple days of work. Yet, this was not the poker venture that would provide his greatest windfall. So, to briefly explain, in most variants of poker... Each player is dealt face-down whole cards that only they can see, and then there are face-up community cards that can be used by every player. In some events, there are only face-down cards, no shared cards, but every event has whole cards. We're going back years. Henry is watching a poker tournament on ESPN, and he's like, this is really dull, this is boring. And it's for one glaring reason. You don't know anybody's whole cards. You don't know what the players have. So there are commentators, but the commentators are guessing, just like you and I would be if we were watching. It's, I mean, it's boring. If you can only see the community cards, why have commentators? Why broadcast it at all? It really has no parallel. It's like if you were watching one swimmer, but you couldn't see the other lanes, that person could be in first or last. Who knows? Feels like watching a single outfielder during a baseball game. Just yeah, getting a shot absolutely. of left field and nothing else. Maybe they're going to run down and out. Maybe they're going to stand there and do absolutely nothing. Either way, it's not interesting. If the announcers can't provide accurate commentary because they're guessing, and if just looking at dudes sitting at a table with no context isn't really exciting... Somebody should probably do something about that. Personally, I'm a big poker fan. 
I love watching the game. I would never in a million years watch it if I could just see the community cards. To nobody's surprise, Henry doesn't want to either. So he hires engineers, he puts in a whole lot of work himself, puts together a prototype of a new card table. It has a glass pane below where each player's whole cards are dealt, and each pane contains a camera looking up at the cards. He gets the patent in 1995, but you'd be surprised how hard he has to push TV execs to convince them that this is a good idea. Eventually, he wins out. The 2002 World Series of Poker is the first one that has the quote-unquote whole cam used for the main event. There are 35 total events. The main event has 631 entrants. The next year, the first year after people can see the cards, there were 839 main event entrants, which is about 40% more. Not shabby. Almost as importantly, it's won by Chris Moneymaker, the most aptly <laughs> named human being of all time. Hell yeah. Uh, Not only determinism. Totally. He enters a $39 satellite tournament. So basically, he wins a tournament to get into a higher stakes tournament. He wins that tournament. He gets his $10,000 seat into the main event. He turns $39 into $2.5 million. Henry Ornstein and Chris Moneymaker create a massive poker boom. The next year, 2004, 2,576 entrants. It triples year over year. Now, you'd think it has to go down sometime. It can't triple every year. And that's right. It can't yeah. triple every year. But last year, 10,043 entrants. Poker is still huge. There were 35 total events the first year they used the whole cam. Last year, there were 95 live events. There's a European World Series of Poker, a Caribbean World Series of Poker, an online World Series of Poker. So the reason I had to clarify that Barbara Enray was the only woman to make the final table of an American WSOP main event a woman has actually won the European main event. Of Don't course. we know someone who participated in the World Series of Poker? Didn't Davis, like... We do. Earn we his do. way in? Well, yeah, and that's a blog post that I'll have to find. I'll send it to you, Mike, if I find it. But basically, our one buddy had, like, $100 to his name and used it to get to Vegas and get a hostel and get a ticket to a game. And he walked away with, like, 60K or some shit. Oh, like my that. God. It Davis has a poker database profile. It's a oh, picture really? of Davis <laughs> at the poker table. Total live earnings, $162,776. He's 19,590th on the all-time money list. That's on the list, though. He's on the list. That's 100,000 more than I've ever won at the poker table. <laughs> uh, and by the way, because I know X is looking at Hendon Mob, if you're ever trying to find poker statistics, Hendon Mob, unbelievable resource. It's good I'm enough so, that it has Davis on it. So There you go. I'm trying so, to figure out, based on the insurance settlement, how many of my shoulders that's worth. I want to know how many shoulders you have. I feel like that's the first question here. Oh, still just the two now, but one was more expensive than the other one. Fair. So, obviously, if you're talking about poker's popularity, you have to credit Chris Moneymaker. You have to credit online satellites that allow people to get into these high-stakes tournaments for less money. But none of that is going to happen if it's not a spectator sport. And it's not a spectator sport without the whole cam. If you don't have these broadcasts, you don't get the excitement, you don't get the viewers. Those viewers do not become interested in playing. Those viewers do not go to Vegas and try it out for themselves. Those viewers do not turn $39 into $2.5 million. All of this can be attributed to our friend Henry Ornstein. Don't take my word for it. John Miller, president of NBC Sports, I quote, He, more than any other person, is the sole reason for the explosion of poker in this country. Everybody who shows poker on television now uses his technology. Poker would be like blackjack if it weren't for Henry Ornstein. It would not be the event that it is now. And let's face it, there's a reason that you don't see blackjack on television and you see poker everywhere. 
If I may uh, interject for one Please. second, maybe this is an answer you don't have, but I'm curious, like, was there ever a point during his influence of this? Like, was it already super set in stone at that point that this was always going to be like this particular, you know, Texas Hold'em format of poker? Was there any kind of like talk of transition to try and break through or were they always convinced that like, this is the format that is going to get to people. We just need to find the right way to do it. So from the very start of the World Series of Poker, which, if I'm not crazy, did start in 1969. Oh, 70, Incredible. not nice. Oh. Sorry. Oh. My apologies. But since the very start, the main event has been No Limit Hold'em. Uh, in okay. fact, in the first one, it was only No Limit Hold'em. When poker was really booming in the late 2000s, early 2010s, they did show other... WSOP events on television. ESPN showed Omaha, which is my personal favorite type of poker. They showed Seven Card Stud. They showed Horse. Nowadays, I think on TV, you're only getting Hold'em, but all of those tournaments still exist online. They still exist at the WSOP. I would say of the 95 bracelet events, probably at least two-thirds of them are not Hold'em. So... Those things still exist. They're still popular with a certain sect, but not nearly as popular as No Limit Holding. Henry, as you can imagine, is now making a whole buttload of money, way more than he's made for any of his other patents, way more than he's made for anything besides Transformers, and far more than his poker playing career. His invention, still in use today. I mean, obviously, you're not going to see poker on TV without some sort of whole cam. But other networks skirted around his patent by putting cameras in different places on the table or just having a man's camera directly behind a guy peeking over his shoulder to try to see what his cards are. But of course, Henry completely changed how this is viewed and still viewed to this day. He started producing poker TV shows. One of them, High Stakes Poker. Uh, it was on the air for a few years. It was off the air for a while. It's now back on the air. It still exists. And fans are only getting inside info thanks to Henry Ornstein. But he keeps playing. NBC has something called the Heads Up Poker Championship. In 2010... It's a 64-person single elimination bracket, just like the NCAA. It is heads up, one-on-one, -on -one, no limit hold'em. In the first round, Henry draws Chip Reese. Chip Reese is such a great poker player at so many variants that after he passes away, the World Series of Poker gives the winner of the annual, it's called the $50,000 Poker Players Championship, and I believe it combines eight different games. The winner gets the Chip Reese Memorial Trophy. That's how good this guy is at poker. Henry Orenstein beats him heads up on television at 81 years old. Crazy. I mean, I mean, this is like the 1960 Eagles are the only team to ever beat Vince Lombardi in the playoffs. And that's what this feels like. I'm going to give you an even more obscure parallel. Uh, this is like Chomp beating Bite Force in BattleBots. If anybody watches BattleBots, uh, Bite Force won three of the first four championships. Its only loss was to against a robot that, like, was kind of just a laughing stock. It was never particularly good. We're talking about not as good as Bite Force and not as bad as Chomp, but yes, yeah, still a monumental upset. For sure. I just, especially within the context of beating the person who ultimately has the greatest achievement named after them. Oh, that, that was striking me as well. As a side note, very appropriately, one other sports adjacent patent I found, granted in 1999 to Henry Ornstein, he has this patent. Uh, it was a system for detecting a moving ball. The patent specifically notes that its most obvious application is for figuring out if a football has crossed the first down line or the goal line. And oh, okay. So like a sensor to detect yes. whether or not something has gone past. Okay. I cannot find any evidence that this has been used in professional sports, but we certainly have this technology today. 
I can't verify that Henry Ornstein had anything to do with it, but what he came up with certainly seems like a precursor to a lot of the technology we are used to today. Poker is Henry's, I don't want to say his last great passion, but I mean, he's getting into his 80s at this point. You only have so much time for so many passions in life. However, what was always his passion? Charity. Henry and Susie support Holocaust survivors. They support low-income families. They pay for surgeries for poker players who have health issues. They take care of Jews of all stripes. Henry personally visits a lot of the people that he gives money to. The Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty says that Henry was their, quote, longest-running and most generous contributor, noting that in three decades of working with him, he never turned down a case. The CEO said, quote, He inspires others. We have other generous people who have come to the Met Council who want to emulate him. That's the best form of flattery you can imagine. Henry and Susie found the Orenstein Project. Unbelievable work. They have established soup kitchens and low-income housing in New York City. They tutor at-risk children in Israel. As a second side note, since we've mentioned Israel, I just want to throw out there, Henry also wrote two books, because, you know, why wouldn't he? He didn't have enough to do in his life. He wrote a memoir about the Holocaust called I Shall Live. He also wrote Abram, the life of an Israeli patriot, which is a biography of a British army major named Abram Silberstein, who fought the Nazis and then helped establish the Jewish state. He lived an incredibly productive and long life. The reason I came to know of him in the first place was that he spent his later years in Verona, New Jersey, right next to my hometown of West Orange. Henry, born in 1919, survives to COVID. He dies of complications in Livingston, New Jersey, on December 14th, 2021, at the age of 98. That's not a bad life. The Orenstein Project, still doing great work after the tragedy of October 7th, and we're certainly not getting into politics. They send food and baby items and all sorts of necessities to affected Israelis, and that's all we'll say about that. I've read a lot of amazing work that has been done by the Foundation. They set up group activities to clean up underprivileged neighborhoods. They set up a free theater camp where... Jewish and Muslim kids and immigrant teens put on shows together. They deliver home-cooked meals to the elderly and the disabled. They put on cooking classes for disadvantaged youth. The Ornstein Project just does so much for so many. And it's all thanks to a man who used his ingenuity to survive the Holocaust, become extremely successful, lose all his money, become extremely successful again, become extremely successful a third time, and make an impact in so many different ways. For his contributions to poker as both a player and innovator, in 2008, Henry Ornstein becomes the first Polish-born inductee to the Poker Hall of Fame. Sixteen years later, I implore you to induct this exceptional human being into the Hall of Guy. I'm trying immediately to remember if we have brought in anyone born in Poland. I believe I was that also trying to this remember. would also be the first Polish guy inducted into the hall. I'm almost certain of that case. We've dipped on the other side of the Iron Curtain a lot, but I feel like Poland is, is relatively untouched territory until now. Well, I think the contributions to multiple obscure sports, first with our, our boy, uh, not Lightning McQueen. Johnny Lightning. Lightning. Johnny, Johnny Lightning. Lightning. Johnny Lightning. Wait, can, we, can we induct Lightning McQueen? Is that possible? Can we do that? Lightning McQueen is way too good to guy. No, that's, that's a great very fair. But no, from starting from that, and then we, we teased James with, with the backgammon. But thanks to Susie's suggestion, we end up with the thing that, yeah, to your point, Cantor, is the only thing that makes poker an enjoyable viewing experience on TV. If it were not for that, it would just be a bunch of dudes with cards yelling at the end eventually, but otherwise sitting there on a moon. And you have to think, 
unless the betting gets all the way to the end of the hand, if you see the flop, the turn, and the river, there's a bet and a call, you're not even seeing what cards win the hand. You're yeah. seeing who wins, who collects the chips. You don't even know what they had when they won. It's terrible. I would never watch poker without hole cams. To that point as well, like, yeah, if somebody pulls off an amazing bluff and wins, you never know it without this cam. Totally. It's a more important, like, visual addition to the sport than the 10-yard line thing. I like the stupid pitch box that we have now on baseball broadcasts. Pitch box is it terrible. Is, yeah. I fucking, here's the thing. When they first got the technology and on borderline pitches, they would then do the replay and you got to see like, okay, that was perfect. That was the way it should have always been applied. The fact Every that pitch, it just pitch lives box there is now. so dumb. It's so fucking I dumb. I hate it. I this is all... this is when I start to become an older person. This is the first moment where I'm like, God damn it, the game we love. What are they doing to it? Leave the pitch clock in. Take out the rest of the crap. Yes, yeah. Pitch clock, fantastic. Everything else. What happened to the game I love? Look how they've massacred my boy. Speaking of what have they done to the game I love, here was my I- initial misgiving. So there's a part of me yes. that, and we've spoken to this a lot, really doesn't love the gambling that exists in sports now, the intertwined relationship of gambling and sport. And what is this if not the ultimate sportification of gambling? But I I think I have been largely won over in, in the production of this by, first off, the idea, I mean, I, I think back to like one of those guys who went and did pinball good enough to convince New York that pinball is like a skilled thing. Like while, you know, being a degenerate gambler is bad uh, and it's bad because gambling is a disease. I'm not trying to be attacking anyone who has a gambling problem. Th- these people might, but also they have a gambling skill. This is a sport. This is a skill. And like you guys are saying, it's a sport that without him would not be able to be presented as a sport. There is no way that the popularity of poker becomes a fraction of what it is today without this. You can say that there are good and bad points to that. I completely agree. With that said, poker existed before Henry. It's going to exist long after Henry is gone. He has not created the means for gambling. He just found a new way to present them, which I think is not quite as bad. Once again, incredibly American. There's been a lot of very quintessentially American moments here. We've inducted oh, builders before. He, he, yeah. he, feel, he feels like a builder of, uh, uh, like of the category. I, obviously, oh, 100%. 100%. I did want to note specifically that he did win a bracelet just to push his bona fides as an athlete himself. But if he is inducted, I do not care what wing of the hall he is in. I will be pleased regardless. Well, if we're considering him as a builder X, what do you think? Oh, I mean, I love it. You know, I, I can't say I'm the biggest poker fan. You guys know me. I'm not. I, I, I've never gone to a casino in my life. Never gambled. Don't drink. I'm a very boring person. But I do appreciate finding a way to take something and make it much more entertaining for everybody who's not actually participating. So I really much appreciate his contributions to making poker interesting for people who do not know how to play poker or have no interest in playing it themselves. To that point, I have been to a casino once and I hated it. I also do not drink. I am right there with you, bud. I just love watching it as a spectator sport. It will be very interesting if this episode comes out the week that I have to travel to Vegas for my buddy's bachelor party. (laughs) (laughs) The the one other thing I was bummed about is for a second when you brought up battle bots, I thought that was going to be the pivot to when we found out that the, this guy that involved Transformers was just also, you know, in some capacity oh, tangentially related to battle bots. Like I got a little excited from the mention of battle bots and was then a little let down that there was not more battle bots involved. However, no one else has had battle bots involved. So like if I've let in well, other people, who am I to start having to- that as a bar now? If you want me to put forward a BattleBots guy sometime in the future, I would be thrilled. You have no idea how happy it would make me to get BattleBots on this show. I would love to know who the guyest BattleBot is. Oh, Rusty. The answer is Rusty. (laughs) 
I mean, just based on name alone, I can't argue. Most robots cost tens of thousands of dollars. Most robots are built by teams. Some of the teams show up to the tapings with three guys. Some of them show up with 15. Rusty was built by one dude, literally out of parts from his parents' farm. Rusty's head is a popcorn bowl. Hell yeah. Rusty... And it's it's the Hugh think, Jackman robot boxing movie. You would you would think that Rusty would be a terrible battle bot. He was rookie of the year in his first season. He went two and three. Now to be fair, he's still, still a terrible battle bot, but definitely a guy battle bot. One might say about this piece of metal, Scrappy. Um, <laughs> oh, I love it. We, we gotta get we, off BattleBots because I'm gonna start <laughs> talking about Michael Reeves making a hot dog maker BattleBot that I watched like two weeks ago, which was hilarious. So let's get back to the guy at hand. Let's do that. Let's get back to the guy at hand. And and I don't think, unless the, either the two of you have have anything else to say, that we need any more deliberation. I think I'm ready to cast my vote. Yeah, I think. I mean, it sounds to me, if I can just segue right into my long rambling. Are we all, we're all there? Okay, right. then, let, let, then let me get us there. Because I will get there eventually. <laughs> we're so close, baby. We're so close. Look, it's, 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 it's a long, winding path uh, into the hall. And it's a long, winding path that Henry Ornstein lived through his own life to, to overcome such great obstacles at such a young age and to then excel in so many fields whether it is with Johnny Lightning, whether it is with Transformers, whether it is with that little camera that shows you the cards that make poker an actual watchable game. There's so many little things that we don't consider sometimes when we think about why do we enjoy things. And Henry Ornstein is the reason behind one of those little things, but it is no small thing to be inducted into this hall, and that is why... It is our great honor to unanimously welcome into the Hall of Guy in the Builders category, in the Backgammon category, in the Johnny Lightning category. In in whatever category you want, there is one word for him, and it is Guy. Welcome to the Hall of Guy, Henry Ornstein. Welcome, Henry Ornstein. Likely our first poll, uh, not our first Holocaust survivor in the Hall. So we do have that going for us. We do have two nickels now on that front. Yeah, he, he and uh, he and our, our boy Shaul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Shaul on your If boy. I had a nickel for every time I've heard you say, if I had two nickels, I would have <laughs> so many, many more, more than two nickels. <laughs> We'd it's, be up to at least a dollar. <laughs> the classics are a classic for a reason. Uh, and I'd like to believe that this has been a classic, and Michael Kenter has been an absolute delight having you on here. Do you have anything you want to plug? I don't know. Got anything for us? Anywhere people can listen to your musings? I mean, you can usually find me listening to Remember That Guy at bit.ly slash Remember That Guy. Um, <laughs> Again, this is the least amount of You're also on Discord and Blue it. Sky. <laughs> I have a Twitter. It's at Cantor Sports. C-A-N-T-E-R Sports. Eh, I use it sometimes. I don't think anybody likes that guy. I sure don't. I'm probably getting rid of it. <laughs> and maybe you'll find me on Blue Sky. Who knows? I'm just happy to be here. Well, we've been happy to have you here, and during the time that we have had you here, I have been one of your hosts, James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. I have been graphics extraordinaire and very honored to be here, Mike Cantor. And we've been very honored to have you. I'm Diaz, and as the rapper Jim Jones once sang, we guy high, no lie, you know this, guy in. I'm glad you said the rapper Jim Jones, because you could have convinced me the other one also said that. I mean, how many totally. Jim Jones are there? <laughs> yeah, oh my God. There are two. Oh, there's, right, two right, 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 yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of Jim Jones. There's two that are notable. <laughs>